Peter writing to believers reminded us that we are a peculiar people, eccentric. We stand out, we stick out. Paul's admonition to the church at Corinth was, was to remind them that they were, as believers, to come out from among them, among secular society, those that embrace a world philosophy and a, a very worldly mindset. And so Paul says, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord God. Touch not the unclean thing. Be different than the vast majority of individuals that are around you. Be those uh, who reflect the reality that you have entered into the straight gate, into the narrow way, a, a way that only few find. And therefore, uh, again, as society at large looks at us, they are able to see that we are different than they are. Not, not just for the sake of being different, but different for, for the kingdom of God's sake. Yeah. Different for the glory of God's sake. God has worked in us. The New Testament language is to will and to do of His own good pleasure. God's, God's performing in us. Now, one preacher said like this, uh, Philippians 1, 6, being confident of that very thing that he which has begun a good work and you will perform it. God's doing something in your life, one preacher said, um, a concert of sorts, and he's not charging anybody to come see it. He's performing in us. Isn't that amazing? And so of necessity we find that there's this new way to live, a changed life. Now, verse 17 here in Ephesians 4 kind of introduces us to a, a new section in this chapter. For, for the second time now in this practical section of the book of Ephesians, starting here with chapter number 4, for the second time, Paul is going to reference the specific walk of the believer, which, as we've already seen, is an appeal to the behavioral lifestyle of the child of God. When Paul says that we are to walk a certain way, for instance, back inside of verse number one, we are to walk worthy of the vocation wherewith Christ has called us. Any appeal to the walk of the believer is, is an appeal to a certain behavioral lifestyle for the child of God. In, in other words, we are not to live, we are not to behave, we are not to communicate in the same or similar manner as the lost world behaves, walks, communicates, or lives. We live differently. Back inside again, verse number one, Paul had, had pled with us to walk worthy of that salvific calling that is extended to us. Walk worthy. Your walk, Paul says, is to correspond to your profession of faith. And then in verses two through verse number 16 of Ephesians 4, uh, Paul has gone through great pains to make sure we understand what it means specifically to walk worthy of the vocation wherewith Christ is called. So, so Paul's not just telling us in a very generalized sense, hey, hey, this is how you're to behave as, as a believer. He gives the heading, uh, walk worthy. Ha have your behavior correspond to the profession of faith. And then in verses 2 through 16, Paul says, this is how you do that. Here is how you ensure as believers that your behavior lines up with the fact that you call yourself a Christian. In other words, it's not enough to just call yourself a Christian and and really in very specific terms it's not even enough to be a Christian as far as one's testimony is concerned Jesus said Matthew 5 16 let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your father in heaven in fact Jesus says same chapter same same section in fact it is absurd Jesus said in so many words for a person to light a candle and to put it under a bushel. In other words, God is saying, I have not saved you to hide the work of grace in your life from all of those that are around you. I saved you to set my glory on display to the world at large around you. And so verses 2 through 16, he shows us how that is to be accomplished. Now, in verse number 17, the text that we first began to read this morning, Paul now comes to introduce to us a, a second mandate of our walk now as believers, a, a second mandate for that walk. And, and this time the mandate is given to us in a very negative sense. Paul says, we are not to walk as other Gentiles walk. Now, there's kind of a, 
a cultural, ethnical way of, of presenting a truth that may not be really grasped by us that are here in America in 2021. Uh, but, but in the day of Paul in the city of Ephesus, it, this was a very significant way of saying, don't live like the world around you. Now, Gentiles in, in that day were, were known for their, their not only pagan beliefs, but for their very heathenistic uh, behaviors, uh, just, just, just the way that they, that they conducted their everyday activities. And so Paul says, don't walk as other Gentiles walk. And so therefore, here is an admonishment for these believers not to behave as others might behave in, in their life. And, and in verses now in verses 18 through verse number 32, Paul is going to show us what that kind of a different lifestyle really looks like. Here's, here's the distinction Paul's going to say. He, he gives the admonition, verse 17, don't walk as other Gentiles walk. Don't live like they live. Don't behave like they behave. And really, in the latter part of verse 17, all the way down through verse 32, Paul says, let me explain to you what living differently than society around you really looks like. Now, now, before we get in really to this text this morning, we've got to understand several things just right up front. I'll give them to you very quickly. Number one is, is again, to look back at that idea of being a Gentile. Uh, the word Gentile is ethnos in, in the Greek. The term basically refers to a multitude of people in general, the, the Gentiles, the nations if you will, of the world. And, and probably not a hard stretch for you to see ethnos in the Greek and ethnic uh, or ethnicity in, in the English language, the, the correspondence there. Uh, just talking about society in, in general is made up of various nationalities, various uh, ethnic groups, if you will. And, and so Paul is saying, uh, you are not to live like all the folks that are around you. Um, again, the idea of, of a Gentile is anyone other than an Orthodox Jew, not, not as a race, but as a religion. They believe in pagan deities. They have a very corrupt form of religion which influences very pervasively the way they behave in their life because they believe this, they behave in this manner, and Paul says you don't believe what they believe and therefore you should not behave the way that they behave. There should be a distinction, uh, which, is, which is interesting because as Paul is writing here, it, it just stands out to me now, that Paul says, don't walk as other Gentiles walk. And he excludes the realm of Judaism. Even though it's a different belief system, there's a transition made into Christianity and some, and some, some various kind of new ideas of the rules, if you will, associated uh, with, uh, with true religion, pure religion, undefiled before God and the Father. But, but just a, a little hint here to show us that, that the morality of the Jewish religion was comparable to the reality, the, the, the morality of Christianity. Uh, again, the idea of what it meant to be holy in the Old Testament is the same real, real, really mentality of what it means to be holy inside of New Testament terms. There's, uh, holiness wasn't found in, in Old Testament terms by a sacrificial animal and by temple rituals or, or, or anything like that. True holiness was found between a heartfelt relationship between a worshiper and, and, and the God of all glory. It was to walk humbly, remember, with thy God. He had showed thee, O man, what is good and what the Lord does require thee. Not, not a sheep, not, not, not a lamb, not goats, not, a, not, not pigeons, not, not, not a, a, a bull, a ram, bullocks, anything like that, but, but it is to have that genuine, authentic relationship. In fact, Paul would tell us in New Testament terms that circumcision is not that which is external, but, but the true circumcision is a circumcision of the heart, cutting off those fleshly appetites of the heart and having a heart that is completely devoted to God. And so in those terms, uh, Paul comes to tell us, don't walk like other Gentiles Whoa, don't, don't live like that. Don't have the same morality as the world around you has. Do not live as society at large does. Don't follow their ways. A second thing that we need to understand here is the authority of Paul's exhortation. I, I thought, again, was interesting. Verse 17, this I say, therefore, Paul says, and testify in the Lord. And I, I'm thinking when I, when I read that, it's not necessary 
necessarily for Paul to say that. That's kind of like having a, a red letter edition of the Bible. Please don't get mad at me, amen. But, but the red letters inside your Bible hold no more significance than the other words that are, that are inside of your Bible. I, I understand the purpose of it. I'm not fussing at you. It's a quick way to see what Jesus was saying versus what he's not saying, but in the totality of it, God kind of said it all, didn't he? amen? And so uh, anyway, you can take that have you, have you want to take that, amen? But, but, but Paul's words in verse number seven don't necessarily determine that, that you and I are going to pay more attention to what he says now versus what he's already said in Ephesians 3 uh, or in Ephesians 4. But, but it is interesting that he makes that statement, isn't it? I testify in the Lord. This is, in other words, Paul is saying to this crowd, I want you to know that this is what Jesus wants you to know. Just in case there's any confusion, just in case there's any tendency or temptation for you to think that this originated with me or this is just one of my pet peeves that I'm passing along to you, uh, Paul's language is, is to say, this is what Jesus wants you to know. This isn't Pauline theology here. His statements here are not to be elevated above other scripture, but simply understood and known as divine revelation. I believe what Paul is saying is this is what Jesus told me when I was in the desert with him for three years. This is what I received by direct revelation. This isn't just me writing something down. Now understand, I think we miss that sometimes with the inspiration of scriptures. A lot of what the Bible writers were pinning down, they were unaware that they were actually writing down the Bible for us. When Moses sat down to write down certain things, I don't think he actually knew what he was writing down. It's the same thing that you and I would be standing behind a pulpit reading from and preaching from as the divine, authoritative, infallible, and there compiled, complete revelation of God's Word. They didn't believe that necessarily. They didn't always understand that. Even the dreams, visions, and revelations that were given to those men as they would, as they would record those events, I don't think they understood the significance necessarily of what they were doing. For instance, Luke said... The the reason why he wrote his gospel record is because it seemed good unto me. It just felt like the right thing to do. And so Luke says, I just, I just got ready. I thought it was a good idea. So, so I wrote it down. And so, so what Paul is here saying in, in, in coming from his heart is this isn't just one of them things that I'm writing. This is something that when I was in, in the desert with Jesus, he told me this. And so I'm just a vessel here to tell you, he told me this, and he told me to tell you this, amen. And so, and so there's that, that authority of his exhortation. And I think for us today that, that the equivalency of that is that tomorrow morning, before you go to work, before you get started in your day, when you open the Word of God, you could say, wherever you open that, this is what Jesus wants me to know. This is what God himself Wants me to know. So the authority of his exhortation. Then number three, just as final thing, and then we'll try to uh, kind of get into the text here, is the relevancy of the subject here at hand. The relevancy of the subject. Paul is pleading with believers, again, not to live the way that lost society does. Now, you got to stop and ask yourself a question. When you study the Bible, a lot of times folks ask me, preacher, you know, I, I want to I get into studying the Bible, reading the Bible a little bit differently, maybe a little bit more in depth. How do I do that? What's some, what's some good tools? And, and uh, Brother John Love, I think, did a, probably an amazing job this morning trying to, try to, try to help us understand uh, the importance of studying the Word of God in, inside of Sunday school in, uh, in Brother Curtis's class. And so, so, so how do I really do that? Well, let me, let me give you just a, a, one little tidbit of advice. The best way you can, or one of the best ways to study the Bible is to ask a lot of questions. It, in fact, I, I love reading behind the Puritans. And if you ever read behind any of the Puritans, that's how they preached. They just asked question after question after question. And, and, and that is a wonderful way to study the Bible. And so when I come to a text, I kind of have that now ingrained in me. And I always think, I'm kind of like that questioning kid. They ask you something and you tell them and they say, well, why? And, and, and you say that and, you say, well, and they say, well, why? And, and after, after a while, I don't know, maybe God wants to smack me. I don't know, uh, because that's the way I feel when my kids do that. But anyway, I, you, you don't learn unless you ask. And, and so I, I come here, and I start reading this text. And, and Paul says something very, very eccentric to me that stands out. He's writing to believers, those that have repented of their sin, placed their faith in Jesus Christ. We, we've already dealt with the background of the church at Ephesus. I mean, they have an amazing testimony I mean, I mean, uh, Aquila and Priscilla uh, having uh, uh, really, really doing some evangelistic work, starting a church inside their own home. The Apostle Paul coming and kind of, kind of, kind of giving that that charter membership to the to the church and 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 formulating it. And from there, the Bible says the word of the Lord is sounded out so that an in 
entire continent. Here's the word of God. You talk about missionary endeavors. Even from the house church, they sent out Apollos who, who becomes a missionary to the church at Corinth or to the city of Corinth. I mean, just amazing accomplishments. A wonderful church. I mean, these folks understand the vicarious sufferings of Christ. They understand that Jesus Christ was born of a virgin, lived a sin-free life, died on an old rugged cross, was buried, and three days later, got up on the third and appointed day. They understand the ascension. They understand some amazing essential doctrines. Paul was with them daily in the school of one Tyrannius teaching every day of his life, pouring into them doctrines that was so necessary for them to have. This is a church ablaze on fire for God. And Paul writes to them and he says, hey, don't, don't walk like other Gentiles walk. Don't live, don't, don't behave like they behave. And so, and so I asked the question, why would Paul have to tell this church that? And, and, and here's, here's what I believe we would find, we would gather as, as we really read here in the book of Ephesians and elsewhere in the New Testament. Why else would Paul make this plea unless it were possible for a believer to return to his own ways, his old ways? There's, there's the reason. Because if you and I are not careful as believers, the longer we serve Him and the sweeter it grows, we'll develop this mentality that it's almost impossible for me to fail. I think that's a real danger. I think it's a real danger that a lot of us kind of flirt around with in our life. That this idea that I'm too tall to fall, that I've been around it for so long that I can never. I appreciate the choir singing this morning. I, uh, 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 I'm too near home to turn back now. Man, I love that. I love that song. Amen. And that's the mentality that we have. And listen, there's nothing to go back to. I mean, I'm content. I'm settled. Hey, look at me this morning. I'm satisfied in Jesus Christ. Praise God. Amen. But at the same time, I must not deceive myself into believing that I cannot make an entire mess out of my life as a believer. Paul is writing this admonition, this second behavioral kind of kind of instance in this practical section. And Paul is drawing our mind to this reality, this admonition, not to walk like other lost men walk. Why? Because it is a real possibility for you and I to make entire shipwreck of our testimony for the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We have this idea, I believe, that, that, that because... God's written our names down in the Lamb's book of heaven and we're, we're so eternally secure that we, could, that we could never mess up in certain ways. But you understand this this morning, and not just, again, not Stanley's theology, but from the testimony of God's own divine word, as a blood bolt believer this morning, there is nothing under the sun that you're not capable of doing inside of your life. There's not one failure that you're exempt from making. You could, you could do things in your life as a genuine, authentic believer that would cause anyone in this world to step back and to say, are they really saved? Paul's writing this admonition because it's such a relevant subject. Now, is it right to return to our old ways at times? Absolutely no, it's not right. It's not right. It's not normal. And that's not the ongoing testimony of the child of God. But Paul is drawing our attention to the reality that it is possible for us to do that. And so we have to stay on guard. Remember Paul also said that they comparing themselves among themselves are not wise to do so. And that, that for the person that thinks he stands to be very careful to take heed. Why? Unless he falls. Because, because a lot of times we get so settled that we don't even see the trap that's laid before us. So, so it is possible. So, so Paul is pleading with them and with us that we need to make up our mind every day that we're not going to live like lost people do. That's simple, isn't it? I mean, that's not, that's not like stuff you'd go to Bible college to find out. And yet it's one of the most profound truths of day in and day out Christianity that this morning when I woke up I should have made a conscious decision I'm not going to live like lost people live today 
That's not condescending. That's not negative towards them. I'm not trying to be rude, crude, or hurtful to any person that doesn't have a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. But I know that Christ loves me. I know that Christ died for me. And I know Christ has saved me for this one purpose in time is not to live the life that most people live. I'm to live differently. And so to make that conscious, everyday decision of my life. Now, now maybe you're saying, I don't know, preacher. That sounds, that sounds crazy that I can mess up in, in some very horrific ways, even as a believer. Is that, is that right? Well, well, listen to this. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse number 3. Paul writing to the church at Corinth. Now, now you stop and you say, well, preacher, do you think there were some lost people at Corinth? Corinth? Well, yeah. Yeah, I believe there were some lost people, probably in the membership at the church at Corinth. And I believe there's lost people in most churches on the roll. And they sit in the pew and some of them come to church every Sunday. And then some of them might even sing in the choir sometimes. And so, yeah, yeah, we believe that. But understand, when Paul writes to the church at Corinth, he's writing to a general assembly of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's writing to those that have made a profession of faith and Paul knows better from his Lord not to try to separate the wheat from the tares. And so in a generalized sense, here's what he says, 1 Corinthians 3 and verse number 3, for you are yet carnal. Well, there's an indictment. For you are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, watch it, are you not carnal and walk as men? Paul says you are, you are living a life that is, that is really based on the carnal, fleshly appetites of life. You don't care enough about spiritual things, Paul says. You're more interested in pursuits of pleasure. You're more interested in meats for the belly and belly for meats. You're more that their God is their belly. You're more interested in what, what makes you feel good. You're, you're more interested in the, in the temporal. You'd rather sleep as come to church. Yeah. yeah you, you, you'd, rather, you'd rather cut your grass as read the Bible. Yeah, you're, you're carnal. You're carnal, Paul says. You, you'd, rather, you'd rather go to a, to a dance as you would go to a teen activity. You're carnal. That's not wrong with that, Paul said. That's not right. That's not right at all. You're, you're carnal. In fact, the specific illustration Paul gives in 1 Corinthians 3, verse number 3, is you've got jealousy. You're mad because they got a new vehicle. You're envying one another. They come to church with nicer clothes on than you do. All of a sudden, you got a bad attitude. You're envying one another. That's not right, Paul said. There's strife. I mean, you're just upset, got a bad spirit about you. You're ready to fight somebody in the church. You're carnal, Paul says. There's divisions among you, amen. You don't want so-and-so to teach your Sunday school class because you don't like them that much. You don't want to be in their group on a Wednesday night praying, amen, because you're too cool for them. Yeah, 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 yeah. There's divisions. There's divisions among you, amen. And Paul says, that's carnal, man. That's wrong for you to be like that. So, so there's envy and there's strife. There's divisions. And Paul, Paul circles back around. Ain't you carnal? That's what he'd say if he's from North Carolina. <laughs> Are you not carnal? Ain't you carnal? Ain't you carnal? And then, and then he follows up. And walk as men. Now, ladies, I know. <laughs> you probably think, yeah, <laughs> That's bad, ain't it? Amen. Be like an old stupid man. <laughs> Amen. Paul, what Paul's, I mean, yeah, of course they're men. I mean, they're, they're the humankind, mankind. But that's not what he's saying. He's saying, you're, aren't you living like just natural people do? And there's the indictment against the church at Corinth and even against us at, at times that, 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 that we're not just men. We're not just, I mean, I think there's, I think there's this prevalency of, of the mentality is popularized by bumper stickers and stuff like that and, and songs and, and all this. And, you know, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. I, I understand that, but it's not just. I mean, you understand the God of all glory left heaven and robed himself in a body of flesh, lived among us. I mean, bled and died for, you know, the value that's associated with you. You know all the wealth in all the world couldn't have redeemed your soul from hell. The price paid to redeem one person from the charred walls of the damned was the very life of God's son. You're not just some sinner. You're not just some man. You're not just some person with a life and an agenda. You are a blood-bought citizen of heaven. And Paul says, live like it. 
Stop walking like other men. Stop living like they do. You're not like they are. You don't have the same father. You don't have the same heritage. You don't have the same desires. You are saved. It's the relevancy of the subject. They were given the fleshly, fleshly appetites. They lived as ordinary men. Matthew Poole made a comment uh, on 1 Corinthians 3, 3, and that's what he said. They were not wholly carnal, but in a great measure so, not having their lust and corrupt affections entirely subdued to the will of God, nor yet such, uh, such as much should be subdued as some other Christians have, but they ought to have had their affections subdued to Christ. They're just folks that ain't Ain't falling in line. You folks in the military, they're, they're in subordination. They're, 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 not, they're, not, they're not putting themselves under the rank of Christ. They're saying what Old Testament theocratic Israel said. We'll do what's right in our own eyes. We'll call our own shots. We don't need the Lord of glory reigning over us. I'll do what's right in my own eyes. I'll decide if I do that. Yeah, yeah. And Paul said, you're carnal. As the day is long. You walk like other men. Now, now, how do lost men walk? How do lost men walk? That's what Paul's going to, going to tell us here, right apart of verse 17 through verse number 19 together in the, in the few moments that we have left together. Paul says, don't live. Don't walk like other Gentiles walk. Don't live like that. So, so Paul, would you, would you give me kind of a measuring rod? Kind of, you know, like one of them... You know, comparisons. Here's what lost people live like. And so when they write down how I live, let's not let it match up with the way they live. Paul, give us the plumb line. And he does that for us. Three things. Number one, how do, how do lost men live? Walk. How, how do they do that? Jot it down. There's an intellectual deficiency. An intellectual deficiency. I forgot to type that up on my notes. And I wrote it down on the bulletin that was up here. Because, because I, I preach off a tablet now, and you can't go back and add anything to a stupid tablet. And so I wrote it down, and then I got to thinking, when Ashley got up there to sing while I go, I wonder if she saw the words intellectual deficiency right before she sang. It might have been a huge insult to her, so I, I hope, <laughs> hope she didn't see that. All right? <laughs> uh, that's the first thing. That's the first thing that, that the apostle draws our mind to. Watch it. Verse 17 again. This I say, therefore, in testifying the Lord, that, ye, that henceforth, that ye henceforth walk not... As other Gentiles walk, watch it, in the vanity of their mind, comma, having the understanding darkened, comma, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them, comma, because of the blindness of their heart. Well, there's a mouthful. And it all relates to this, to this vast arena of an intellectual deficiency, all right? It's very interesting here that, that Paul is going to point out or point back to the mind again, as, as he's already done several times through this epistle, for the basis of a person's behavior. Paul has told us repetitively that, that what will determine the way you behave is what you believe. What you think is going to determine what you are. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. And that's, that's the message Paul has been drilling into us. And the idea here is this. We're not to live as other, other men live, as, as Gentiles live. We're, not, we're not, to, not to live like them at all. And the idea here is that the believer's mind is renewed. It's renewed. And this is, this is what Paul's, Paul's told us from chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, and even into chapter number 4 here. The believer's mind is renewed. The believer's mind ha- is understanding. It is comprehending. And it is knowledgeable. All of those ideas are, are associated with the believer's mind. Okay? He's been renewed. God's cleaned his mind up. And that was necessary in the work of salvation because the carnal mind, the natural mind, is an enemy of God. It's, there's enmity between the carnal mind and God. You don't, lost people don't think the way that they should think. Romans 3 says that there's none that understand it. They don't understand because sin has so affected the faculty of your mind. And so even your very thought, your intellectual patterns are distorted because of sin's pervasive influence inside of your life. Lost people don't think the way you think. That's why, that's why they think you're weird for coming to church on a Wednesday night. That's why they think you're weird for not going to certain recreational activities that they go to. That's why they, they, don't, they don't get it. They don't, you witness to them and they have that, that blank stare on their face. They just they don't get it. 
They don't get it. There's an intellectual deficiency that's associated with them. But not so for the believer. Paul says, God's cleaned your mind up. You get it. You get it. Um, Paul wrote to the church of Corinth. He says, I has not seen, ear has not heard. Neither has it entered into the heart of, uh, of them, uh, neither has it entered into the heart of men the things that God has prepared for them that love him. A lot of times we say, well, that's heaven, and we just don't realize how beautiful heaven must be. Page 105 in the Red Book, we sing it. I love it. If you don't like it, amen, I ain't got nothing else for you. I mean, it's a good song. Amen. And we don't. I, I, we don't conceive of that. But that's not Paul, what Paul's talking about when he's talking about that to the church at Corinth. Because the very next verse says, God has revealed them unto us. He's talking about the message of salvation. And how it's impossible for someone to really get the gospel message of salvation unless God reveals it to them. That's what he says. He says, I has not seen, they, there's no perception. Ears not heard, there's no comprehending. The, the, the heart of man can't, can't perceive it, can't, it can't receive it. It doesn't happen. But God has revealed them unto us. He's cleaned our life up. He's cleaned our mind up. We're, we're renewed. There's understanding. There's knowledge. There's a comprehension. But not so for the lost person. The idea is that because believers and unbelievers think differently, we should also behave differently. Don't we believe differently? Don't we think differently? God's cleaned our mind up. We think differently. And we even believe differently. We, we know good from evil. We know right from wrong. God's enlightened us to those truths. And, and the idea, again, is that because as believers, we have the capacity to think differently now, we also have the capacity to behave differently. Where once we were the servants to sin, our minds were, were held captive by Satan to do his will. We were, we were inside of his domain. But now... We've been liberated, we've been freed, we've been redeemed, we've been, we've been bought with a price. And, and we have that privilege now to glorify God in our body and in our spirits, which are as God's. Any deviation from proper behavior stems from a deviation of thinking properly. How you think is very important. Amen. How you think is very, very important. Don't, don't, don't turn to it this morning. But the, the book of Proverbs, one of our favorite books of the entire Bible, the, the practical advice on just normal living. If you want to behave properly, I mean, uh, the book of Proverbs is just an a, a, a amazing resource for us. Listen to the first seven verses of the book of Proverbs and how it deals with how you think, how you understand what you know. The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, to know wisdom and instruction to perceive the words of understanding, to receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, and judgment, and equity, to give subtlety to the simple, to the young man, knowledge, and discretion. A wise man will hear and will increase learning, and a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsels, to understand a proverb and the interpretation, the words of the wise and their dark sayings, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. How you think is a, of a, m immense importance for your life. Now, Paul mentions several things as far as intellectual deficiency is concerned. Number one, there was the vanity of their mind. Their logic is very empty. That's what the idea of vainness is speaks of there. It was empty. The way they think fails to produce the desired result. They think I should be able to do this and all will be well with me. That such thinking, Paul says, is a very vain or empty, useless way of thinking. A lost person is characterized by wasting his life in useless pursuits because his mind conjures up useless thoughts. He doesn't think right, therefore he doesn't behave right. Simply put, he's not capable of thinking right. Secondly, Paul says his understanding has been darkened. Their understanding is perverted or distorted, Paul says. It's not that there's nothing rattling around up there. It's just that the wrong things are rattling around up there. Their understanding has been perverted. It's darkened. In a spiritual context, two plus two for them should equal eight. They just don't get why it doesn't equal eight. And they cannot, for the life of them, understand why it cannot equal eight. They are mentally unstable and handicapped in the arena of a spiritual context. Their understanding is darkened. Number three speaks of the blindness of their heart. This, this is a reference to their unresponsiveness to truth. Truth goes out, but truth doesn't penetrate. Truth is delivered, but truth truth is not received. They are blind in their heart. 
Blindness. The word blindness refers to what is rock hard, what is impenetrable. Uh, they, are, they are stone or calloused when it comes to receiving the truth of God's word. Truth just bounces off from them. If you've never seen that, sit up here on a Sunday morning sometime. Truth just bounces off from them. It never gets into the depths of their heart the way it should. They know better than everyone else around them. And, and, and here it is. Paul is pleading in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 17 and 18. Not with lost people, but he's pleading with saved people not to be like lost people. And so what that tells me is this possible for us to sit in a, a church service to read our Bible, to have our parents try to give us instruction for the pastor to try to counsel us and for us to be vain in our mind and for us to have our understanding darkened and for us to have a blindness associated with our heart so that when truth comes, it just bounces off from us like bullets did off Superman. And there's nothing of progress that's made. Here's here's, here's the second thing this morning. Not only is there an intellectual deficiency, number two, there's a numbed conscience. A numbed conscience. I, I think, again, the tendency here is that we just kind of fly by it. Notice the expression in verse number 19. Who being past feeling have given themselves, and then it goes on. Don't miss that introductory phrase there. there listen, they walk in the vanity of their mind. Their understanding is darkened. Their hearts are blind. And they're past feeling, Paul says. Who being past feeling? One word inside the original text. They're past feeling. Uh, it, it, the word means to grieve out, to become apathetic. The idea is you keep doing something so much that you eventually stop caring that you're doing it. Preaching has no more effect in your life. Bible study has no more effect in your life. You've so grieved and quenched the Spirit of God that conviction has no more uh, production inside of your life. You have become to a place where you are past feeling. You are dead on the inside, so to speak. What people say to you doesn't matter. Rebuke doesn't enter into your mind or into your heart. You are past feeling. Such a person has built up a resistance to all accusations of sin in his own life. He does no wrong. And no one knows better than he knows. Again, Paul is describing the general characteristics of a lost person. But he's speaking of saved people not to be like lost people. In Romans chapter 1, verse number 32, Paul addresses the reality of, of folks that, that do unthinkable and even unspeakable actions. And the problem with them is they that, they that do them, they, they, don't only, they don't only do those things, but they have pleasure in them that do them. The idea of what Paul says, Romans 1, 32, is what, what's worse than doing such things is getting to a point where you see nothing wrong with what you're doing. And, and listen, hey, hey, listen right here. If you're not careful, that's exactly the path some of us are on. And what you think is cute, and what you think is funny, and what you think is nonchalant, and you're just going to haphazardly one day trip over into the will of God, and God's going to bless your life one day? Ain't nothing but a lie of the devil. A numb conscience, they're past feeling. When's the last time you cried over sin? When's the last time you come down to a, you don't need a mourner's bench, I forgot. Preaching don't do anything for you. You don't have to make a decision right here. You'll make it later on when you skip church. Right? I mean, that's, a, you, it's, that's not nice preaching. I'll give you that. Amen. But it's right. See, I don't like that. I don't like that. Well, neither does the devil. <laughs> yeah. Amen. Amen. I mean, that's the reality, right? I don't need what anybody. I've got it all figured out. Do you really? Because I'm not seeing much fruit come from your life. I think like that sometimes. I think, well, I've got it all, all figured out. And I'm looking all around me, and there ain't no God around me in 10 miles sometimes as far as production is concerned. I get, I get distorted in my life. Start thinking, I've got a better way. I've got it figured out. The things that used to apply to me, they don't matter anymore. The preacher that God used to give me the message of salvation, I know better than he does now. Past feeling. 
past feeling. I ain't got no, no emotional connection anymore. Nothing. I don't need that anymore. I've got it all figured out. Wonder why God did give you a church. Wonder why God did, back in Ephesians 3, give pastors and teachers and evangelists for the church, for the, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity. Wonder why he did do that. Wonder why he didn't give everybody one of you. Yeah. Yeah, it's about right, ain't it? Amen. They're past feeling. Past feeling. You failed to see that the path you're on leads to death. Now, there's, a, there's a fanciful Greek story. When I say fanciful, I mean completely absurd. But, 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 but the story itself helps us to understand the foolishness of such a lifestyle. Listen to it. There was a Spartan youth who stole a fox, but then inadvertently came upon the man from whom he had stolen it. To keep his theft from being discovered, the boy stuck the fox inside his clothes and stood without moving a muscle while the frightened fox tore out all of his vital organs. Even at the cost of his own painful death, he wouldn't own up to his own wrong. That's how we are sometimes. I ain't done nothing wrong. Past feeling. Again, Paul is pleading for believers not to mimic unbelievers in this way. Number three, and we're finished this morning, there's an unrestrained lifestyle. How do lost people walk so I can stay away from? What's that standard? Well, there's an intellectual deficiency. You don't want to get there. There's a numbness to your conscience. You just don't feel or see anything wrong with anything you do. And truth just bounces off from you. You don't want to get there. Number three, there's an unrestrained lifestyle. Now, all of, all of this, an intellectual deficiency and a numb conscience, conscience results in what we read about in the last part of the second part of verse number 19. Read it with me. They are past feeling, and therefore, they have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. Now, I'm just going to go out on a limb here and say that probably within the last week to two weeks, the word lasciviousness just hadn't come out of your mouth. You know, you just, you walk through the mall and say, Man, those teenagers really are up to a bunch of lasciviousnesses. <laughs> you probably didn't say that this, this past week, okay? If you did, somebody might have wanted to interpret you because they thought you were speaking in tongues, all right? The term refers to an absence of all moral restraint. It's kind of a licentious lifestyle, a license to sin, live however I want to, and nobody can say anything about it. There's no more boundaries. There's no out of bounds. There's no rules for me. It's, it's the attitude of it's, it's my life. I'll live it like I want to. Nobody can tell me what I can or cannot do, which is akin to rebellion, which is as a sin of witchcraft. I'll do what I want to do. I'll do it how I want to do it. A lifestyle that is unmetered and unchecked. Again, Paul references this same exact idea of a lifestyle in Romans 1.18 when he, when he talks about that crowd. They hold, remember this expression, they hold the truth in unrighteousness. The idea of they hold the truth is the idea of suppression. They suppress the truth in an unrighteous lifestyle. They should have known better, yes. Why? Well, God gave them a conscience. They were born with that. They didn't need a pastor to get that. They didn't need an independent fundamental Baptist church to get that. They didn't need uh, four years of Bible college and two or four more years of seminary training to get that. They just was born knowing better than that. God, God took the time to write on their hearts, their conscience bearing witness, the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. The light of nature, the sin man, uh, has, has testified to those realities. They knew better at one point in time. And maybe, maybe who knows, maybe they had a grandma, a granddaddy, a mama, a daddy, a Sunday school teacher, a pastor, somebody who was a praying for them and was witnessing to them and trying to plead with them to get right with God. And they, they had the truth hurled in their direction is the idea of Romans 1.18. But they took that truth and they pushed it as far down as they could and they, they stopped on it to press it down as far as they can because they wanted to live the life they wanted to live. And nobody was going to say anything any different to them. They have pushed the truth so far from them. There's no telling what they'll do next. No telling. And then Paul says they work all in cleanness with greediness. They now live 
complete, impure lives. Every sin and vice is open season for them. There's, again, no boundaries. And Paul says their impure life is connected with greediness. Greediness, not, not specifically acquiring more and more possessions. This is the idea that they live impure, unclean lives while they're buying boats and campers and, and, uh, and, and, and vacation spots around the world. That's not, that's not the idea of greediness here. That They just now can't get enough of the wrong that they're doing. Again, it's, it's not the idea that, that they're doing something that's wrong. It's the multiplicity of that, uh, of how fast they're doing what's wrong. They, they, they do wrong and that's wrong, but, but then they multiply. The idea of Genesis 6, the earth is filled with violence. It's not just an occasional murder, but everybody's killing somebody. I mean, I mean, it's not just Slocum Street. I mean, it's, it's Walnut Street, and it's, it's Berkeley Boulevard, and it's Spence Avenue, and it's everywhere that you go. It's all around us. That's the idea. It's everywhere. And they're doing it so much. And so, and so they live in pure, unclean lives with greediness. They can't get enough of their sin. It's become habitual for them. They're hooked on it. They can't get enough of it. It's a horrible place to be in. A horrible place to be in. In fact, whenever you and I see somebody in that kind of a situation, that's usually when we stop and think from our high spiritual plateau. Man, it'd take a miracle to do something for somebody like that. You ever thought that? No, you can be honest. Amen. You ever thought about it? You saw somebody, and may, maybe they once were in the church and they got so far away, or maybe they just never been in church, just lived, and you thought, man, I, you know, like, like it's your turn to pass out the gospel track, and you see that dude, and you're thinking, man, stink, why it's my turn to pass out the gospel track? You know? You think, man, it'd just take a miracle to do something for somebody like that. And God's saying, man, even as believers, it's possible for you to get that bad off. It's possible for you to get that bad off. And Paul says to us that are here today, back in verse number 17, don't let that ever happen to you. Don't let that ever happen to you. Did Paul say that in the mean spirit? No. Paul said because he's, he's just so mad with the people? No. In Romans 12, 1, Paul says it like this, I'm begging you. I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, with tears in my eyes on bending knee, I'm begging you. Don't live like that. Don't go the same way they're going. Don't wind up living the same kind of life that they do. Be on guard against it. How do you do that? How do I do that? And number one, you make sure that your mind is right. Good content always coming in. Make sure your mind, I, I, like, I like it, uh, stayed upon Jehovah. Hearts are fully blessed. Keep your mind right. Number two, stay sensitive to truth. See everything as a big deal. There's not an advocacy moment for drama. Don't go home and start watching the soap operas this week. <laughs> but everything in your life that has the potential to sever you, your relationship with your God, should be a very big deal that you take very seriously. Amen. Stay sensitive to truth. If you start getting around it, cut it off. Jesus said, better for you to cut off your hand, pluck your eye out. Take it seriously. Number three, never let sin be habitual. Listen, I, I wish I was preaching to a crowd that was perfect or had the potential of being perfect this week, but we don't. We don't. John said, my little children, these things write unto you that you sin not. That was the heart of a pastor to his congregation. And it, and it is a direct reflection of my heart for all of us that we don't sin. But then John said, but if any man does sin, we have an advocate with the Father. You know, you know, what, John, you know what John said? John says, please don't sin. I'm begging you don't sin. But if you do, don't let sin go unchecked. Deal with it. Immediately deal with it. Seeing we're compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us run with patience the race that is set before us. And let's lay aside in the process that every weight in the sin which does so easily beset us. I don't know what your sin is this morning that you deal with on a regular basis, 
but I sure know what the ones are that I deal with on a regular basis. And Paul here saying for us, be sure not to let sin get the mastery over us. God's given us better grace than that. Let's stand this morning for prayer.